Aloha. I'm Marcia Joyner. And are you counted? Today, we are going to talk about how you shape the future of Hawaii and the United States. So, are you counted? So today, we are going to talk to Annie Mae Sokols, who is a partner, I think it's partnership director of the Census 2020 in Hawaii. Annie Mae, welcome. Aloha. Aloha, Did I get it right? <laughs> thank you so much for having me again on your show. And thank you so much for being one of our committed partners in the field, making us, helping us, joining us in this journey as we prepare our community to be counted this coming 2020. So thank you again. Well, thank you. Uh, tell us about the history of the census and what it does and why it's important. So we can go all the way back to 1790, was it? Yeah. When well, we, we've been when, no, uh, yes, we've been doing the census for more than 230 years, for 230 years. And so this is really one of the oldest activities that um, this country has been doing um, for the purpose of reapportionment. So making sure that uh, we have the right representation in the House of Representatives, redistricting as well. And also um, the census decides or guides the distribution of federal funds that comes into our community. Funds that support different services for children, um, our kikis, our kupunas, you know, community centers, our roads, transportation, healthcare, Section 8 housing, SNAP, are really a lot of um, federal, federally funded programs that we all benefit from. Now, you mentioned um, the numbers in Congress. So I um, have told everybody we have to be counted because we have enough people for another congressional district especially when our congressperson from CD2 is absent. Um, anyway, that's a different story. However, uh, we do want everybody to be counted. You sent me a great article, and these are congressional seats that changed because of the census in 2010. The Bureau announced the U.S. population had grown to 745,538 million people, an increase of about 9.7%. States going, gaining one or more seats in Congress, Arizona, Florida, plus two, Georgia, Nevada, South Carolina, Texas, plus four, Utah, and Washington. The states losing one or more seats in Congress, Illinois, Louisiana, Massachusetts, Michigan, Missouri, New Jersey, New York 2, Ohio 2, Pennsylvania. So we can't afford to lose, but we can gain. We do have enough population if everybody signs up. That is newborns, everybody, grandpa, everybody has to sign up. So tell us. Yes. Tell us what we do to get signed up. Okay, so from what we're hearing, we've been, again, we've been doing this for a long time, but this is the first time that you will have an option to respond online. So we've been hearing that our community knows that the census is coming, but they're really not aware that they can do it online now. So for less than 10 minutes of your time, depending on how many of you in your household, um, you can just go on your laptop, on your iPad, in your phone to respond online. So it's a website that you just go to and that will start beginning March 12, 2020. So we have the timeline. So it, we always say April 1 is a census day, but every household in America will start getting their mail 
around March 12 to 20, 2020. And you will get an invitation in the mail to respond online. And later, that, that's the sample, the sample of the letter that you will get online and you have a census ID. So uh, not, you'll get on the mail, the sample letter you will get on the mail. And that is an invitation for you to go online and count everyone in your household. So that's beginning March 12, 2020. So watch out for it on your mail and immediately just do it. Um, however, if you're not able to do it during that time, March 16 to 24, the U.S. Census Bureau is going to send you a reminder letter again um, to respond to the census. However, if you're still not able to do it during that time, uh, March 26 to April 3 is a reminder uh, postcard. So that's your third reminder. And then during that time, we will assume that your household may not have access to a computer or internet, and which is, which is a reality for a lot of our um, communities. So you will still get your paper questionnaire on your fourth reminder. So I just wanna um, make sure that everyone still knows that you do have the option online you still have your paper questionnaire option and you can still make the phone call. So on your fourth reminder on April 8 to 16, your reminder letter will come with a paper questionnaire. OK, so don't be like, oh, I'm not. I can already feel I, I know we've been hearing this from our partners. And, and when we talk to the community, it's like, how about us? We don't have access to computer or we're not really uh, online. You know, we don't really like going online. We're not tech savvy. We still have the paper questionnaire and you will still get your paper questionnaire. Now, if you still did what not respond. The... Huh? Yes, Ms. Marsha? No, I was going to say about the library. Can they go to the library to use the, the computer? Yes. We have an amazing partnership with a state library. There are amazing partners. So you can go to your libraries and, you know, access the computer there because they have those resources so that you can respond online. Just bring your census ID and your letter. Um, it just makes it easier, you know, if you have that census ID. You can still sign up, you can still register, but having that census ID will, um, it's much easier for you and for the Census Bureau as well. And then around April 20 to 27 is a final reminder letter. And then after that, um, you really have, a month and a half almost to respond um, to the census, self-respond, be proactive. Um, you can do it at your own leisure. And then after that, we do the non-response follow-up in which on May, we will be um, knocking on doors to those households who did not respond. So honestly, it's so much easier to just go online or do your paper questionnaire, whatever works for you during that time frame. So you don't, you know, you don't get a knock on your door and you can do it at your own leisure. Well, yeah, you know, two thirds of the state of Hawaii is rural, and so many of them do not have internet connection. So, do you? Mm -hmm. What's what's the deal with getting all of those people? It's fine for us that think because we've got internet, we kind of think everybody in the world does. But you know, some places on the Big Island, for instance, they do not have internet connection. Places like Hana, some of them do, some don't. So there's, uh, that is a real issue, expecting people. And then know some people right here close to me that have internet, but they know how to, they don't know how to do it because they said, well, they're old and they don't know what to do and whatnot. So those, there are a lot of people that are, don't know what to do. So how do we deal with that? What are we, what are we doing? Are there people to help? Um, do you have people that can actually help them through the process? Thank you so much for your question, Ms. Marsha. And because, you know, it really highlights a lot of challenges um, in the community, such as lack of access, you know, as you mentioned, to internet or to um, computer or any kind of device that, you know, they can do this online. And we're very much aware of that. And so for the rural areas, depending on, uh, we have this 
uh, system actually where you can look at type of enumeration areas. So depending on where you are, especially for rural areas, you have a different um, enumeration. So for you, it will be an update leave. What is an update leave? An update leave is you will get your paper questionnaire immediately. You're not gonna go through, you're gonna get five reminders. Well, you, you will get your paper questionnaire immediately um, because we know that that area already has um, lack of maybe internet or uh, computer access. So you will immediately get your paper questionnaire and just directly send it to the mail. So that will be a, what we call the update leave. And then we actually are implementing, and this is really huge because it's really one way of bridging those gaps in the communities and how can we really reach out to those people who might have a hard time uh, responding one way or another, whether it's technology, language barrier or whatnot. So we want to help our community um, alleviate that problem. So well, this is a big ask that we would like to, you know, ask organizations out there who could help us. Help us identify areas in your community, um, the who and the where, because we have this uh, program called Mobile Questionnaire Assistance, and we will send our staff there. We will send with the technology that they need to help that community get counted. So they can go there and, you know, they can be enumerated um, in this mobile questionnaire assistance events. We call it MQA. So um, right now we're actually going to, I'm actually going to go to training later for that and we will get, we'll give more information. But right now let's start thinking about where are those areas um, that we need help. So you can contact us, the, the Census Bureau, your city complete count committee um, and ask for, you know, help if you haven't met any of us yet, but for those who are already our partners, um, you know, please reach out and let let us know. Like this area might need um, help, so we're going to those low response areas where we know there are challenges and we are already foreseeing them. But at the same time, later on, when all of this go live, and we will have a live update um, of which census tracts are responding or not, or slow to respond. So we're gonna go there and try to help them. And we're also working with our partners uh, in making this happen. So it's not just us, but our community partners, community leaders who are there in the field, who knows their community well, and who are communicating with us with you know what, what they need. So um, please let us know if there's any way that we can help your community we can send people there with their devices and we can get them um, get them counted. Well, now, when we're talking about getting everyone counted, so let's, let's look at that. If, well, of course, newborns, you want, you want the baby to be counted, absolutely, because that person's gonna grow, so they need to be included. Then, but we have people in the military, we have, uh, students away at college, and we have family in the lockup at OCCC or wherever. So tell us about those people, how they are counted. So for example, you mentioned newborn babies. Thank you so much for uh, mentioning the newborns because zero to five years old kids are usually not counted by their family for one way or another. In one way or another, maybe they're just too young and they forget that they already. <laughs> but you know, there's many ways that families forget, or maybe the family, the <laughs> child lives with parents. You know, there's so many ways that the kids are not counted, and so we're really pushing this count your kids um, in this coming census. They will be counted with the family and sleep most of the time, okay? So just add that, the cakey there when you're doing your, your uh, questionnaire. Now for um, the college students. Now, college students will be counted where they are going to school, so where the university is. So if you have a kid 
who's um, attending university in Nevada or California, they will be counted there. And at the same time, for those uh, mainland kids uh, who are coming to school here in Hawaii, they will be counted here. So depending on where they live, um, if they live in dormitories, we're, we will be counting them in what we call the enumeration group quarters. They will be counted in their dormitories where they live. And if they live around, um, you know, the university, we will also be counting them are, um, um, in their rented uh, home or space, wherever they will be. So they will be counted here if they're studying here. And then for those who are, for example, um, in a correctional facility or, um, or in a group home, they will be counted the same thing, group quarters. Um, so we will send an enumerator there uh, we will be working with them with a, their point of contact and they'll, they will be enumerated or in a group quarter um, set up. Same with, with the military. It depends. We are actually working as well with our military uh, to make sure that we get a complete count because the military uh, personnel and their families will be counted if they are assigned. For example, they are assigned here. They will be counted here in the state um, of Hawaii. So we are working very closely and actually we're meeting next week with, um, you know, our point of contacts uh, in different installations as well to brief them about the coming 2020 census. So the same thing, if they live in a barracks, they will be counted in a group quarter setting. Um, if they, if, if you, the family lives um, on base, you will still have the same opportunity as everyone else to respond um, online, on paper, and on the phone. And the same thing with the military who are living, you know, off base. You you will be counted just like everyone else. You will get your um, your letter to self-respond if you are in a self-respond enumeration area. So, yes, uh, we encourage everyone, if you get that letter to self-response, to please do. And if you get your paper questionnaire immediately, then just fill it out and send it on the mail. Well, now, if um, let's say you you have a student from China that's born with you for their term here at the university, how is that person counted? So our visitors, as long as um, they're here for Just, so they're going to be in your home. Yeah, they're going to be in your home. Let's say for nine months. How are they counted? Um, six months and one day, actually. So, so, um, so that's counted in your household. Counted in your household. Yes, that's yes. actually one of the okay. questions. I was so glad I was in the <laughs> workshop because I'm like, how is that? And they like six months and one day. Like, okay, so that makes so for a visitor. Okay. So that's if you're a visitor. And you, you're counted in the household where you are physically residing. Is that correct? Definitely. Okay. Um, yeah. is you know, for six months and one day, um, you will be counted. You will count your mom there, um, or however who's visiting, whoever is visiting you. So, what about uh, foster children? They're in your household. Foster, foster children, children living in your household will be counted in yeah. your household. Okay. Household, whoever so, is living in your whoever. even if you blood relative, they will be counted in your household. So um, actually, we would like to make this appeal, like um, even if renters are, you know, someone is renting one of your rooms to please count them as well. They're not gonna, that's the address. You're sharing the same address, right? So. Um, we encourage everyone to so, count. So like some of those monster houses that have, you know, who knows how many people. So all of them are counted in that residence. Or do yes. they, one of those, if they're, re, if they're renting a room, would they be counted on their own? Would they get a letter to, to um, if that's their, address they're renting a room but that is their address would they get a letter also that is only one address 
So what I mean, one letter, one census ID for that household. So even if someone is re you have a monst monster home, you have a big house and you know you're you're um, renting one or two rooms, please count those renters in your household as well who are living with you um, because they won't get you're sharing the same address, right? So they're not going to get um, another letter. So we encourage everyone, even if you're not, you know, blood uh, relative, if it's if it, this person is living in your household to please count them. Yeah, OK. I was trying to hope we are not leaving anybody out because like I am hell bent on. We have to have everybody counted because we need a CD3. We need another con congressional district. And Definitely. I think that to, in the long run, we are talking about shaping the future. That is shaping the future. Another congressional seat. So um, more than anything. Now, uh, but let's see, because you know, I, I am, I'm not sure that I understand how this works. Everything is private. However, if I go back to 1900, I can pull up the census and find that John Doe was living here and he had a wife and there were four children in the house. How does that work? That it's private and yet it's open to the public. So the information is released after only, yes, the confidentiality of your information. So we would like to remind everyone that the census is important. It is safe. Your private information is protected by law under under Title 13. Um, we don't uh, share any of your personal information. And so your information is safe. Um, it is only released after 72 or 73 years. I'm not 72 years, I believe. Um, please correct me if I'm wrong. I'm thinking 72. I'm getting, I'm getting confused now, but um, it, it's only released after that length of time. So if you think about it, like a lifespan of a person, um, average, um, and then that's really where what, you know, some of our partners are sharing with us, they're using to trace their ancestry, um, to learn more, you know, their grandparents or their great, great grandparents to learn more about the history of their family. So um that is also one of the ways that the census is being utilized but that is after a period of time a very long period of time of 72 years oh okay 72 years all right okay so I'm <laughs> yes. so like you know um <laughs> so we can do it, right like that's how um some people are connecting the census and i'm like oh yeah that's that's very and it's very important for a lot of us who would like to know more, or maybe we didn't know about our family or our great great grandparents. So it's it's good to know their journey as well. Yes, no, that's lots of. So I'm glad you told us how long the, the span is before it's released. Yes. So that yes. nobody's feeling that, and and especially here where you have so many immigrants and people that come from countries where they wouldn't dare tell the government their business. You know, those people have to be made comfortable because Definitely. so many of them, especially in Chinatown, where you have seven different Asian cultures in that little area, and they have to be comfortable because some of them definitely don't want their government to know all of their business. Now, yeah. are the questions, the kinds of questions asked other than your name, address, um, your date of birth, what other questions are asked? So we also ask, um, so your name, your phone number, so we can follow up with you if there are um, any, you know, we want to follow up on anything that we probably missed out on or you forgot to include so your name um your phone number of course the address your race and i think they ask i'm trying to grab my my copy here um so you can put your race as well uh it's really however you 
um, identify so you can check if you feel like um, you're if you're a, a mix multiple races so please do um, share that as well so you can check and you can even write that down as check well <laughs> yeah and then um, so there are nine questions I'm trying to remember them off, off the top of my head right now but the, what else we asked gender or sex so male female at the moment that those are the options and then we're also asking um, the what do you call that I'm, I'm trying to remember right now I'm sorry but there are nine <laughs> questions no 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 it is that do they ask uh, income whether you're working or any of those kind of places we don't ask your social security number we don't in this big census we don't ask your income we don't ask your bank account information credit information um definitely if something like that comes up that is not the decennial census we do have other surveys that ask that um but we only do it on in sample but not everyone for this decennial census we don't ask those questions so we're not going to ask for your financial information. That's, that's one thing too about fraud, yeah, um, to prevent fraud. What are the things that we're not asking uh, the household um, this coming 2020 census? We're not going to ask for money or donations, and you will not be contacted in behalf of any political party. So those are no-nos for this coming decennial census. So just to avoid any um, scams or fraud um, at home. So. And then if you have any questions, you can call 800-923-8282 um, or your any, contact any of your local representative um, to ask or inquire if, if you are not, if you're unsure about this person um, asking uh, about these questions. So, so the person that, that comes, they'll have identification that says who they are and whatnot. Yes, so the, they will have an imposter. I, yeah. Yes, they will have a valid ID. Um, and then with their photograph, they will have a Department of Commerce watermarks and expiration date. Um, and I think I believe our director will have a letter as well. And then I actually have a sample copy here. I wish I shared it with um, with you guys as well, but maybe next time. But here are the questions that we will be asking. I can just go back. So how many number of people live in your household? And then um, if there are children in your household, those kind, um, if it's an apartment, a house or a mobile home and your telephone number. And then, um, so yeah, we ask the sex, the age of, of the person and then, um, you know, your, your race as well and then you can put that in the box check the appropriate box that um works out for you or that you know you identify with and yeah those are just um some of the basic questions in the form well now when we look at this uh, overall how do you know how much hawaii has been getting from the fed since uh the 2010 has they, this is the population of 2010, but that's been 10 years. Have we increased in population? Have we increased population? And, or does the census have a mechanism by which they count uh, every five years or to account for people uh, dying, moving, what have you? And as the community changes, uh, how do you keep track of those things so or, or do you so right now in terms of population um according to this the state data center there they have like they have uh, the state data center is actually a really good resource for this um state specific um statistics because they produce different reports that describes our demographics or economic um, situation as a state uh, and even household situations. But um, 
right now we're on track. Uh, estimated we are um, growing. Um, in terms of money that comes into our community, there's a good study, George Washington University, counting for dollars study. It really depends because it changes every year, again, um, of how much money we we get from the federal funding. Um, so around the last time, it was over $3 billion. But that's big, that study, but it really changes. So every everyone counts, everyone matters, so that we can get okay. our appropriate for our, our We're just about out of time. So can you give us the telephone number and the census uh, web, but one more time because we're out of time. So your telephone number and the website. Thank you. So you may contact me at 808-892-5141 if you have any questions um, regarding uh, the census or if you want to host events uh, to support your community. To learn more about the census, please check 2020census.gov slash jobs, and we're also still recruiting. So if you would like to serve your community, please apply as well um, on our website. But there's so many resources there. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. And we'll see you next time.